Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another week of our departmental seminar series. And just before we begin, I would just like to say there is a special series that's going on next week, I think a Tuesday, though, not Thursday. I think we try our best. Wait, hold on. Uh, I'm hoping everybody hearing me now. So next week, we'll be having a special series on Tuesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. local that will call later on in the day to try and accommodate some Swedish students who want to give a seminar within the department, okay? And I will announce it again at the end, so just look out for that. But today, though, we are we have Mr. Alan Stapleton, and I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Stapleton. Now, Mr. Stapleton began his journey here within the department where he obtained ESC in Applied Sciences with honors. Now, this drive, he has knowledge and development and self-actualization didn't stop here as he continued his studies with a postgraduate diploma in management studies and a master's de um, degree in resource planning from the university of the west indies campus and university of aberdeen aberdeen respectively with this body of knowledge mr Adam suffered ventured out into the work world where he shared his competencies in various capacity now due to exact exists and cannot be listed here due to time constraints, I nonetheless try to give a proper representation of all the work and contribution has done. Now, some of his roles and achievements include, but are to National Water Commission, where he's the manager, when he was the manager on safety and occupation and health um, for about 19 years. He, while there, he implemented emergency response protocols for chlorine leaks, fires, and earthquakes. He reviewed and updated the emergency response for hurricane floods, developed and implemented a based inspection and reporting system. And this is very important as we're moving into technology age, we need to update our systems to match that. At Caribbean Maritime University, he developed safety and occupational health program itself and improved the emergency response capabilities of the institution. And I could go on and on, but with respect to time, I will just edit those examples. However, currently he's a PhD candidate in the Occupational Environmental Safety Health Program, and he's here to present on the testing, on testing a model of risk perception as a mediator for group level safety and safety behavior. So please help me to welcome him as he presents. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Benny. Um, morning to the faculty and staff members of the chemistry department. As um, you have been told as on the screen, I'll be presenting on testing a model of risk perception as a mediator of group level safety climate and safety behavior in a Jamaican company. All right, so an overview of the presentation. Um, we'll have an introduction, which will look at the rationale, a bit of literature review, research questions, hypotheses, aims and objectives. Then we'll have a brief look at the methodology, the results, and a little bit of discussion, conclusion and recommendation. Trying to get something from my screen here like this. Okay. All right, so we'll start by looking at some definition. And by safety climate, we mean the sheer perception that workers have of a priority that is given to safety management in the company. And so specifically group level safety climate would focus on management at the supervisor level. Risk perception is really the subjective judgment work has developed of the likelihood of a hazard to cause harm and the extent of that harm. So it's looking at the probability and the severity. Safety behavior, look at um, compliance of workers with mandatory standards, as well as how well they participate in voluntary activities like safety meeting, reporting accidents, and so forth. And by influence statics, we are attempting here to measure uh, the change uh, in behavior 
that um, a supervisor could bring about by whatever method he adapts to, to do this. But currently, there's a shift away from lagging indicators in, in safety, things like accident rates, uh, fatalities last time that are retrospective, to more leading indicators such as safety climate, which is the one I'm looking at, to monitor conditions in the work environment. By, by using this um, leading indicator, if you cut down on the reliance of um, a company to depend on system failure to remedy the defects, which would be the case with the lagging indicators. So this shift has been partially driven by the recognition that human and organizational factors, rather than just the physical and technical features, will be responsible for safety and health events within a company. And there are many studies that found safety climate to directly uh, impact safety behavior, as well as there are studies that show that perceived risk is a significant feature in safety behavior. So the study was conducted in two phases. Phase one of the study looks at um, the indirect impact of safety climate and safety behavior by testing whether the worker's perception of risk would mediate the relationship between group level safety climate and safety behavior. It also examined a model of risk perception which looks at uh, risk as comprising accident frequency or equivalence the injury severity or lethalness of uh, whatever um, hazard is, is um, in consideration, as well as the risk control that employees have over the hazards. Um, phase two of the study examined a model of influence static, which is comprising persuasion, coercion, and coercive persuasion. So these are the tactics that a supervisor would use to get safety compliance and safety participation. Now, there are not many empirical studies that have been carried out on the influence behavior of managers and supervisors. Although we know that managerial effectiveness really underpin the ability of the managers to influence subordinates and their peers as, as well as supervisors. Um, so the rationale for the study, um, there have been various studies on safety climate and safety behavior. However, we, we have not found any study in the literature which examined the indirect impact of safety climate and safety behavior through the risk perception pathway. So we, we therefore thought it would be important to look at any relationship that exist between these variables. And so we set out to investigate them. Also, when we look at the literature, uh, we did not find any study that made direct linkages of persuasive and coercive influences on workplace safety behavior, even though there might have been these influences on other behaviors, for example. So as a result of this gap in the literature examining the influence of persuasion and coercion and occupational safety behavior, uh, which is broken down into safety compliance and participation, again, we decided to explore these influences. So um, just a bit on the literature, safety climate really is a summary of the sheer perception employees have of their work environment. Um, these perceptions would relate to safety policies, the procedures and practices. And safety climate refer to how work has perceived importance on work and the prominence that is given as is conveyed in these policies, procedures and practices. Climate is now considered a significant feature in the function of organization and the capacity to develop and sustain working environment. And many studies have shown that a positive climate is related to better practice, lower accident, lower um, um, bad behaviors. And the climate construct can be analyzed at the level of the organization, which is organizational level climate and group level climate. And this is so because it is believed that work has developed specific perceptions of the specific level subskill are better to, to boost measurement than just the one measurement on climate. You can measure climate at the organizational level as well as at the group level, which is what we are looking at. So this multi-level construct of climate is plausible since uh, the management create and define the policies, goals, and procedures. But the supervisors have to be the ones to implement these procedures. And this 
allow for significant variation between work groups since different supervisors would be assigned to different groups and the priorities would probably be different. So a little bit on risk perception, objective risk, as we know, is risk exists, whether or not you know about, about it, while a subjective risk answer the individual feeling of danger. So the vaccine, for example, and the resistance to it as a subjective assessment of, of the population. Um, so risk perception then is a subjective judgment at the likelihood and the consequences of accidental occurrences. You know, so it's the appreciation of employees to foreign hazard to inflict harm to them and the extent that this harm might cause. So normally they would ask people about their judgment in high dangerous activities in order to test their perception. And it has found a causal link between the perception of hazards in the workplace and accidental occurrences. And there's also evidence that perception might impact performance. And um, since work has perception of risk impact behavior, then um, the resultant exposure to risk and the association between risk perception and safety behavior that is also um, violent. Behavior, we found that in the, in the first half of the century, 88% of accidents were attributed to unsafe behaviors, and also errors, 85% of industrial accidents were attributed to that unsafe behavior. So safe behavior can be defined with a dualistic dimension, compliance, which is um, adherence to standards and mandatory um, policies and so on, while participation is a more voluntary activity. So continuing, looking a little bit now on compliance and participation, the workplace practice influence and compliance as distinct from participation. Some studies have been undertaken on that. And it has been shown that compliance and behavior is critical since human errors have been shown to explain more than 80% accident, as we mentioned before. Now, coercion and persuasion as compliance method. Um, some studies so feel we have equal standing since they both deliver results that affect the cost and outcome of non-compliance. And in a study examine, examining leader influence static and safety participation was found that leaders can promote safety participation via different influence topics. And so I want to look at um, coercion persuasion and the combination of those. So to look at research questions for phase one of the study, the variation in safety climate among work groups, does group level climate predict safety behavior of workers? Does group level climate predict risk perception, that is the frequency, Liberty and control that workers have. Does perception mediate the relationship between group level safety climate and safety behavior? It is the central question of this original this first field research. Does a group level climate risk perception and safety behavior vary with whether employees experience an occupational accident? Does group level climate um, perception vary with whether they experience occupational injuries? Does safety training predict? Safety climate perception, safety behavior perception, and personal vulnerability to risk. And are employees feel enough personal vulnerability to hazards the same as their co workers feel? So, from this, we develop nine hypotheses. Number one, there's significant variation group level safety climate. Number two, group level safety climate predict safety behavior. Number three, group level safety climate predict accident frequency injury severity and risk control. And number four, workers' perception of frequency, severity and control mediates the relationship between group level safety climate and safety behavior. Um, this is a, a, a conceptual model of the, of the um, mediation. We're saying that safety climate directly impacts safety behavior in a total way, and it in fact packs it through these pathways, the AB pathways, perception, frequency, and control, as well as there would be a direct effect. So that those would be an overall effect, as well as there would be a direct effect 
on climate on bill, which would be through the C dash pathway. Uh, hypothesis five, there is no difference in group level climate, perception of accident frequency, perception of injustice severity, perception of risk control, and safety behavior between employees who have experienced accident in their present job and those who have not. And this is repeated in number six, just changing the word accidents to injury. Number seven, safety training predict safety employees perception of group level safety climate, perception of accident frequency, perception of injury severity, perception of risk control, and safety behavior. Number eight, safety training predict perception of personal vulnerability to hazard. And nine, employees believe their coworkers are more vulnerable to hazards than themselves. Um, the aims and objective, the study aim to determine the relationship among group level safety climate, perception of risk and safety behavior in the workplace and whether the experience of occupational accidents, injuries and safety training impact these variables. And the main objective would be to determine if there's variation in the group level climate and whether perception mediate the relationship between group climate and safety behavior. Determine whether group level climate, risk perception, and safety behavior vary with accidental occurrence and injuries. And to find out how safety training impact group level climate, perception of risk, personal vulnerability to risk, and safety behavior. Um, for phase two research question, do supervisors use the tactics of persuasion, coercion, and coercive persuasion to influence workers' safety compliance and safety participation? Is there a difference in the influence tactics used by supervisors for safety compliance and safety participation based on the gender of the worker? Is there a difference in the effectiveness of the discrete sub variables of persuasion and coercion in influencing safety compliance and safety participation? Which discrete influence tactic do supervisors utilize and employees react to? How do supervisors and subordinates view risk perception in the workplace? Uh, there are five hypotheses. The persuasive influence of supervisors predict employees safety compliance, A and B, safety participation. H2, the coercive influence of supervisors predict employees safety compliance and participation. And hypothesis three, the, co the coercive persuasion influence of supervisors predict employees safety compliance safety participation. Hypothesis four, there is no difference in the supervisor's influence tactics on the gender of workers exerted by coercive persuasion, persuasion, and coercion. Hypothesis five, there are variation in the effectiveness of the discrete sub-variables comprising persuasion and coercion in predicting safety compliance and safety participation. And the aim and objective here is to explore the persuasive coercive influence supervisor and workers' behavior, as well as workers and supervisors' personal perspective on risk perception. The objective to determine the effect of persuasive and coercive influence of supervisor and employee safety compliance and safety participation, determine the perspective of key stakeholders and the influence of supervisors' persuasive and coercive characteristics on safety behavior, and to determine qualitatively the workers' and the supervisors' perspective regarding perception in the workplace, risk perception in the workplace. Method, briefly, the study design, the study design is a cross-sectional survey utilizing the parallel conversion mixed method approach. So this is a merger of quantitative and qualitative data. And phase one of the study utilizes a questionnaire as the quantitative instrument, sample workers at the National Water Commission, sampling strategy, uh, 1,093 non-supervisor operation and maintenance workers from the Eastern and Western divisions were eligible for phase one of the study. The sampling frame was stratified into work categories, for example, operators, lab workers, electricians, and so on. And these stratas were then divided into clusters of work group. And a group is a set of workers with the same supervisor. 90 such groups of workers were identified from the sampling frame. A two-stage cluster sampling was projected for the sampling frame. A total of 512 participants was targeted for the first phase of cluster sampling. 
and the employees were then randomly selected from each cluster or group for inclusion in the study. The group size varied with the smallest group having at least two persons. And the workers who faced at least three of the hazards or risks being explored in the study were eligible for the study. Data was collected using an interview administered questionnaire with the following parameters, group level safety climate, five point scale varying one to five, one meaning strongly agree, strongly disagree and five meaning strongly agree. See if the behavior scale ranging one to five with one being the worst behavior and five the best behavior. And risk perception variables was a five point scale, one to five with one meaning none or never, and five often major or great. In phase two of the study, is to utilize a questionnaire as a quantitative instrument and conducted simple random sampling from the 660 employees remaining after the original sampling frame uh, from, from phase one of 1093. The recommended sample size was determined to be 239, a 5% margin of error, 95% confidence level, and a 50% response distribution. Qualitative data was collected using a key informant interview guide for six supervisors and a structured interview guide for 20 employees. Supervisor influence was assessed using the power base as the final part 1994. Six factors, logical, expert, referent, reinforcement, extension, and competence evaluated the persuasive influence and six factors, status, reflected, coercive, charismatic, manipulative, and emotional evaluated the coercive influences. And a combined scale of the 12 factors evaluated coercive persuasion. Data was analyzed using SPSS version 20. Factor analysis was carried out to determine the validity of the instruments and Cronbach Alpha was used to determine internal consistency coefficient. The statistical method, descriptive statistics used to analyze demographics. The one-way analysis of variance used to analyze variation in group climate. There was regression analysis, multiple regression analysis, independent t-test, and peer t-test to evaluate other factors. The results are uh, phase one, the response of uh, 463 persons of the 512 with a response rate of 90.43. And the demographics you could see it was largely dominated by male 99.5%, um, age group, over 25 constitute 94.3% of the, and 3.4% of the, of the sample. And in terms of educational level, only 8% are primary group. So 90%, 92% are either secondary, tertiary, or skin training. Work experience, again, 1 to 10 years, 49.3% of the sample, and about 45% at over 10 to over 30 years. In terms of accident experience, 36.9% experience accident, while for injury, 34.8%. For hypothesis one, there was significant variation in the group level safety climate. So hypothesis one was strongly supported, that was found. Question analysis to look at hypothesis Two to four, use mediation and bootstrapping as um, proposed by Prishan is 2008. And it was found that group level climate predicts safety behavior. So hypothesis two was strongly supported. So hypothesis three, group level safety climate predict perception of accident frequency and risk control, but there was no correlation between safety climate and perception of injury severity. So it, it was removed from the mediation model and uh, we found hypothesis three as been partially supported. Hypothesis four, workers' perception of accident, frequency, and risk control was found to mediate the relationship between group and safety climate. So it was partially supported. And the direct effect of group level climate and safety behavior remained significant. So that confirmed partial mediation. And um, the hypothesis was partially supported. There was no significant difference between the strength of uh, the indirect effect of accident frequency or risk control both influence in the same about the same extent. So this is the model again, um, the final result showing that group level safety climate impacts safety behavior, the total effect um, through the mediation pathways, 
the indirect effects and the direct effect of safety climate remaining after mediation. In terms of um, hypothesis five done by independent Z test, it was very strongly supported. So that um, there's no difference in the group level climate in terms of perception of injury, severity, safety behavior. But um, in terms of percep risk perception and risk control, in terms of accident frequency, sorry, and risk control, those had a difference with those who had an accident as opposed to those who did not. So it was partially supported. And it's demonstrated here in the table when the others were not, but these two were, part, were supported. And this is a repeat in hypothesis six, except that here we're looking at injury and it was the same. It was partially supported, um, accident frequency and risk control. There was a difference with, with those who had injuries and it's shown here in the, in the table, as opposed to those who did not. Um, looking at hypothesis seven using regression analysis, the real at safety training, predict group level climate, safety behavior, perception of accident frequency, perception of risk control. All of these variables add um, significance to predict a variable safety training. So hypothesis seven was supported. In terms of hypothesis eight, safety training predict employees perception, personal vulnerability strongly supported. And here, some data show that hypothesis nine was strongly supported. In other words, the coworkers feel that the, the um, workers feel that the coworkers are more vulnerable to hazards than themselves. And for phase two, there was correlation between persuasion, coercion, and coercive persuasion, and safety compliance, but not safety participation. So we had to look at uh, hypothesis one to three, section uh, part A of the thing which went on compliance and um, not part B, which looked at safety participation. So hypothesis 1A was very strongly supported. Um, persuasion predict safety compliance. Hypothesis 2A strongly supported coercion um, predict safety compliance. And hypothesis 3A coercive persuasion strongly predicts safety compliance. In terms of hypothesis four, independent T test, we feel no significant difference in supervisor influence statics with gender. So that was strongly supported. And multiple regression, uh, hypothesis five, that uh, was strongly supported. There's a clear difference in the ability or effectiveness of the sub variables to predict safety compliance. We found that reference power, um, being competent. Um, and some level of manipulation, predict safety compliance. And by reference for by looking at the supervisor being a role model, modeling influence through example. And uh, of the 12 sub variables, only motion correlated with safety participation and it predicted safety participation. So again, it shows that there is a clear difference in the sub variables to predict safety participation. And these are the tables that show in reference power and competence and in terms of persuasion, manipulative, in terms of coercion, of predicting compliance and predicting participation, motion. So if we could uh, discuss this a little, it was a relatively young workforce, uh, 68 and 75 percent respectively at the population below 45. So this put the company in a good, good stead for long-term availability of labor. Well-trained workforce over 92% uh, secondary tertiary education or skill training, um, supported by high-level working experience, 49% one to 10 years, over 30% are in the case of, um, you know, in some cases over 40% have been more than 10 years. The very small percentage of female in phase one, which is a reflection of the heavy industry and um, the male domination here, we, we did not use gender as analytical parameter in this phase. In phase two, it was a little better. Cronbach alpha um, above seven showed that the uh, reliability 
of the, the, um, the questionnaires and the risk perception is still again 3.6 and 0.89. The sample in adequacy over 0.6 for the um, KMO test and the severity test less than 0.001 confirmed the sample in adequacy. Between group variation in safety climate confirmed there's an uneven implementation of safety policies across the organization by supervisor. The policy in use does not necessarily coincide with the declared policy. The show supervisor have a leeway to apply different priority provision based on their own discretion, their work pressure, understanding other work situation. And this parallel is a phenomenon that Zohar sets out in in 2005. It may also imply that the responsibility account of the system for supervisor are clearly defined or enforced. So the study found employees seem to be very large in terms of supervisor. As we stood there for the leadership practice, a frontline supervisor is critical. It was underscoring the need to select the right person in this position. Um, the finding of an increase in safety climate um, resulted in reduced perception of accidents and increasing perception of risk controls and important one, it magnified importance, focusing in reducing accident likelihood and improving control. And this could also mean accidental occurrences are low or that the widespread nature of the organization affect the communication or accidental data or the accident that, that, that communication might be weak. Also, the fact that lethalness was not found to be a significant part of it scored the importance of focusing on reducing accident likelihood and controlling risk, both of which decrease our worker propensity to accident, in which case it's lethalness. Um, which does negate likelihood would be nullified. But looking at it from another point of view, because of the non correlation of this parameter, it's safe to claim it. There were seven fatalities in the five years prior to the study, just leading up. So we are believing that um, this fatality experience by the company um, might have heightened the perception of severity and threw it out of work with. Um, compliance. This is something we have to go back and study as a, when, when there is there are none of these events to see if it might be so. And the fact is that in some studies, um, there's actually correlation with severity. And with mediation, only partial, the safety climate, safety area pathway means significant after mediation to show that safety climate is a stronger predictor of safety behavior than the perception of accident. Frequency and risk control, and the signal again that the supervisor seems to be more important in accident prevention and the employee's own perception of risk. So they follow that the safety leadership is important and might not have to focus here, and especially on the frontline supervisor. It is also like that employees feel that to assume greater responsibility for their safety, and we'd have to explore this a little more. The fact that the group level climate and safety do not vary with accident experience, meaning that workers do not blame supervisor themselves for accident or injury that are um, more prone to blame um, chance or upper management. And this was found by Canton 213 when he studied organizational climate and found that um, there was a correlation there. Um, again, um, in 217 support this position. It's they thought that structural approach to safety climate perception tend to focus more on organizational level safety climate than group level climate since the organizational factors which constitute it are more linked to the organization or uh, to top management and the supervisor. Therefore, the outcome such as injury tend to be linked to organizational level climate. And this also alluded to um, in the context of safety climate influencing many of the safety outcomes. On the other hand, the fact that workers' perception of risk and accident control increased, accident and injury experience suggests that um, these workers could be a key resource in accident prevention, those who have experienced accident and injury. And it suggests that targeted safety training is important in improving safety climate and safety behavior, as well as risk perception. But it also is a contradiction that the group level climate is more important in predicting safety behavior than risk perception is, since safety training is a stronger predictor of risk control than it is of safety climate. 
In other words, tree and rural projects will be more dependent on risk perception than supervision. There could be a cultural phenomenon on the land through the forecast accept more responsibility and dependence on supervision. And this can be um, The fact that safety training predicts workers perception as a kind of safety value. Even though the training increases their ability to control risk, and again, this is to be explored. Also, the phenomena whereby workers believe their colleagues are more vulnerable to risk than themselves, feel an optimism bias or risk denial that need to be debunked as it often leads to workers exposing themselves to increased rates of injury and fatalities. And then here, was, this and here I need further exploration. And we see this from time to time in people going down into confined space where the others have collapsed and they feel that they wouldn't collapse. So these are some of the for phase two, the finding of hypotheses 1A and 2A suggests um, argument that persuasion and coercion have equal standing as method of achieving safety compliance. Also, Trump et al. Um, advocated that persuasive influences can be successfully employed in cases where we have collective and real interests are aligned, such as in safety and health issues. Coercive persuasion as proposed in hypothesis 3 has proven to be effective in influencing safety compliance and even show a greater correlation in safety compliance than persuasion and coercion. And this is quite instructive and suggests that supervisor approach could be mixed in getting the best safety compliance goal as recommended by OSC et al. In their research, I found um, that. Also, the qualitative study of employee, um, they prefer a mixed approach. This finding corroborates um, courage and some of the others who highlight the role of coercive persuasion in achieving behavioral compliance. And the fact that hypotheses 1A, 2A, 2B are not supported, you know, in other words, the safety participation is not influenced by coercive and persuasion or coercive persuasion is very important. It indicates that workers' participation or safety is not influenced by these variables in the composite format. And that some other factors are at play in obtaining safety participation, for which the descriptive statistic of the data shown um, a higher sample mean and even safety compliance. The finding could imply that the cultural factors are at play regard to eliciting safety participation. And this echo finding of um, Fuan Yuk with regard to factors influencing American versus Chinese workers. They demonstrated that rational persuasion and exchange has influenced static and safety to be more highly rated by American managers, while Chinese managers rated the effectiveness of coalition gives an upward appeal. So it's just saying that cultural factor might be um, influencing. It could, it could also signify that the safety maturity of the workers is very high and have gone beyond compliance to commitment as suggested by you um, and some others. Or the extent of being inherent in the behavior of the workers as implied in the structural interview of the employee, which claim responsibility for safety in their workspace. Hypothesis four confirmed there's no difference in the influence static used by um, between male and female response to fairness on the part of supervisor in the quest to achieve safety compliance among employees. It might, however, have positive implication for the wider attributes of gender equality within the organization. Based on hypothesis 5 A and B, for achieving safety compliance, supervisors could consider the effort on reference power um, being an example in role model modeling influence, which will be a good example as found by some a number of studies by being competent or having the capability or the aptitude to achieve a group and organization goal through their performance as cited by the employee in qualitative studies. And supervisor may also use uh, uh, some level of manipulation to inform and discriminate their capacity to um, allocate resources. Supervisors can forge good human relations with employees just triggering an emotional bond which obliges the employee to take on safety initiative, as um, is found that this could influence participation. And this is similar to something found that with coalition, which speak to partnership and alliance, 
and somewhat like emotion and deal with forging close personal relationship to bring about participation. So the main conclusion is the study demonstrate a strong variation in group level of safety climate, group level of safety climate predicts safety behavior, supervision has a greater impact on safety behavior and accident prevention and perception of occupational risk. Safety training has a strong influence on group level climate, safety behavior and perception of risk. Um, persuasion, coercion and coercion, but it will able to predict safety compliance. However, supervisors will concentrate their influence, effort on being competent, being a role model, using discriminate uh, manipulation to achieve safe compliance and emotion to achieve safety participation. And following these, a raft of recommendations for the company. Um, we train supervisors in safety leadership to influence a positive group level climate and thereby improve safety behavior. Management could um, be cognizant of, should be cognizant of the importance of selecting the right persons, supervisor position as influence and workforce, especially as it relates to accident prevention is critical. They should ensure competent supervisors are assigned to oversee workers and prevent accidents. Supervisors as well as workers should be held accountable for accidents and um, prevention by enforcement of policy provision which set out responsibility of all workers. Both supervisors and workers should be trained in CF system of work in all hazardous areas. CF training should specifically target various risks used by workers for them to achieve better control. Management of the NWC should utilize accidental experience to create greater awareness of accident prevention among workers. Supervisors should adopt a mixture of persuasive and coercive influence tactics. I, they should employ coercive persuasion as a composite tactic in pursuing safe compliance among workers. Supervisors should concentrate on using technique of preferring power, competence, and discerning the manipulation as the main discrete tactics in influencing safety compliance and motion, eliciting safety participation. They may also employ logical and formal authority, secondary tactics as revealed in the qualitative study. Supervisors should heighten this perception among employees by their own example, being competent, logical, exercising formal authority and using the power as necessary. And the ambiguity in the um, responsibility enforcement system for safety behavior and safety performance need to be urgently addressed. The management reiterated in the jurisdiction of supervisors set out in policies. As we found in the quantitative studies, there was a little bit of uh, gray here. here. The management of the NWC should ensure the safety is fully integrated into all work processes, outlined in the policies and program. The final study should be shared with employee supervisor and management of the company. The human resource department should ensure safety orientation program are executed for all employees. And I want to thank you for listening and look forward to some healthy feedback. Seeing as first I'm presenting this since the transfer from the MPhil, um, any positive, any feedback would be, I'd be grateful for. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for the presentation. The floor is officially open for questions. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Campbell, so your mic is open. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Denny. I, I want to you know, congratulate and commend Alan on his presentation. And as the coordinator and a person, Ash, I am, also happy for the opportunity that OSH issues can be aired in this particular forum. Um, just quickly to add, Alan, though, in terms of your, your um, research and speaking about lagging and leading indicators, to your knowledge and experience, to what extent are similar companies, large companies, focusing policy on leading indicators rather than lagging indicators? Well, I, um, I I believe that is happening now in many companies. They're more uh, using all these inspections. Um, some of these 
leading ones to to um, see what they need to do to prevent the lagging. But as we know, both are important because you need lagging in order to, to plan and predict and put things in place and so on. You know, it's just that it is more retrospective, but they have, they, they have equal standing, so to speak, as the corrigan and persuasion. But it is extremely important that some, some effect be given to a leading, which at one time really wasn't um, was taken as, as serious as it is now. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, yes, Dr. Gallimore, go ahead. Okay, um, thank you for the presentation. I actually got kicked out at the start and was trying to get back in. So I'm not, I was unable to see the first part of the presentation, but thank you nonetheless. Um, so my question actually, and you may have addressed this before, but the, this was at NWC. And so the question is, um, how did you get all of these persons to participate? What was the what was the tactic, for want of a better word, that you employed in um, getting that level of participation in the um, in this survey? Okay, thank you for that question. So you got miss some of it. Okay, so I, I was employed there, as you would have known at the time. And um, basically, we had permission to do the study and, and the goodwill of the of the employees, because we had to point out to them that it was not compulsory. But, um, you know, we have a very good relationship with them. And in most cases, they, they responded. It was relatively, a relatively long question here, but um, we were fortunate and lucky to have had that level of participation. Okay, okay. When you said relatively long questionnaire, what, how much of their time did it require? Right, so that, that first questionnaire, um, the first phase with the questionnaire would take maybe 25 to 30 minutes very skillful. Okay, 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 no problem. Um, one other question. Um, I'm not sure I understand the difference between coercion and persuasion. What's, what, what, are, what is the actual, yeah, how, how do you distinct, how do you distinguish between those two? Okay, so we had set out the, the, the six, um, categories that make up persuasion and the six that make up coercion. But in a nutshell, persuasion would be more soft topics as opposed to coercion, hard topics. But the, the, the sub-variables are actually set out in the study. If I could get back to it quickly, I could show you them. Lost. Right, so here they are. Right, so the six factors of persuasion, logical, expert reference, like being examples and so on, reinforcement, extension, being helpful, caring, and competent. While they had the tactics for coercion. The status or position of the person reflected, um, power by attachment to knowing the head and so on, coercive, charismatic, manipulative, and using emotion. Those are classified as coercive tactics. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, are there any other questions? I'll just check through. Seeing anything in the chat. Oh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Campbell, do you have another question? Yes, I'd ask another one, Mr. Denny. Um, Go ahead. 
since this study, Alan, was done in the National Water Commission, and you have, for your results, you had good, you know, internal uh, validity in, in, in your findings. To what extent do you think that this, these results could be externalized to other large companies in Jamaica? So, um, the, the water being a manufacturing company, quote unquote, even though we do not have another large entity doing similar thing. Um, we could, the, the manufacturing companies, we could, um, we could try and replicate that there because, um, water is uh, classified as a manufacturing. So, um, you know, the TPS, the separate the you know, we could, uh, we could, could try it for application in those years. Oh, okay. And since I'm on the floor, I ask you quickly, the workers, your findings said that the workers did not take responsibility for the uh, causation of accidents. Yet in another section, they, they took responsibility for health and safety. That's seemingly a little contradictory there. Um, I know you couldn't do everything in the study, but that's something that could be further explored through further qualitative means, like focus group discussion to find answer, because that's a contradiction there, but I know that may be something for future work. Yes, yes. While they took responsibility for the workspace, um, the data is showing that, you know, for them and their supervisor, they, they don't tend to, to get the blame, which is which was found by Canton and some others uh, that it was um, the organizational level that tend to place this. And this other um, person saying, because of the structural approach to, to, to the thing, which um, is really a focus at the top management, they tend to focus the outcome back at the same era. So um, that, that explains it a little, but as you have said, yeah, uh, we could drill down a little bit more with some qualitative um, um, inquiry. But even in the qualitative, they, they, they do put a lot of onus on the supervisor to, to be responsible. Okay, thank you. And rightly so, thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Campbell, and thank you, Mr. Sapleton, if there are no questions, other questions on presentation, we would like to thank Mr. Sapleton for the work he has done. And I encourage you to, you know, see if when you're publishing, you can actually, like um, Dr. Campbell saying, extend it to other companies because we do recognize there are some inefficiencies, or I should say deficiencies within all of these organizations and you, your research could possibly help to address some of these issues. So congratulations on the work, and I hope that it goes even further. Um, but before we go, I just Thank want you. to remind, oh, yes, yes, Mr. Campbell. Remind you that next week is our special seminar on Tuesday at 11 a.m. Please look out for that email with the Zoom details. In that Zoom session, our last seminar session, I think, I have to, um, we have our Swedish students who want to do a presentation, so please uh, help us accommodate them to, um, for next week, Tuesday at 11 a.m. And I would like to also say a hearty congratulations to Dr. Nelson. He was here earlier. I think he probably got kicked up because of the Wi-Fi issue. But congratulations to Dr. Nelson and his team for the work that they have done, you know, that was awarded. Um, with that being said, I wish you guys a safe and productive week, and I'll see you next week at Tuesday at 11 a.m. Have an awesome rest of your day. Until next week.